Good afternoon, everyone. I am Juan Carlos Molleda, Edwin L. Arts and Dean and Professor in the School of Journalism and Communication of the University of Oregon. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the, tw annual, the 21st annual Ensel Payne Award for Ethics in Journalism ceremony, panel, and Q&A. This award celebrates the pinnacle of our profession, journalists who tell life-changing stories while adhering to the strict ethical standards of the field. Journalism ethics has never been more critical. Our democracy continues to be attacked this year from the attempted coup on the Capitol to the recent wave of restrictive voting laws. Journalists' most important job is to serve as democracy first line of defense, to shed light on corruption and provide platform for stories that would otherwise go untold. To perform our duty as truth tellers, change makers and public watchdog, we must constantly earn our community's trust by showing an uncheckable commitment to ethical storytelling. Ethical journalism is the lifeblood of a democratic society. Seattle broadcasting legend Ansel Payne believed this so deeply that he established the Payne Award in 1999 to honor journalists who struggle with tough ethical dilemmas and make the right call especially when the right call is the toughest one. Now, as journalists navigate the realities of a global pandemic, making the right call is even more challenging and more important. Today, we'll be hearing from our 2021 winners and finalists, as well as our 2020 winners. They'll each share some of the tough calls they made behind the scenes while reporting their stories. They also answer some questions. So feel free to add your questions in the questions and answer module as you think of them. Before we begin, I would like to thank my fellow members of the Payne Award Selection Committee for the many hours they spent reviewing and discussing the applicants of so many deserving nominees. The judges are all experts in journalism ethics, working journalists and editors, professors of journalism and communication, and past Payne Award winners who understand well the rigorous ethical standards of the field. Nonetheless, the pool of nominees uh, was so outstanding this year that choosing just one was exceedingly difficult. We are grateful for our judges, time and expertise. You can learn more about them by following the link in the chat. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Tim Gleason, professor of journalism and director of the Ensel Payne Award for Ethics in Journalism to present and moderate conversations uh, with our honorees. Welcome, Tim. Well, thank you, Juan Carlos, and it's uh, it's great to see you in a in a virtual Allen Hall today. Um, uh, so, it's my pleasure to to welcome everyone here, and thank you for coming uh, from wherever you happen to be in the world right now. Um, when he created this world, this award, Ansel Payne envisioned a program that would reward journalists to act with integrity and character, restore public trust in the media, and inspire current and future journalists to do good work. And while Ansel ran a news organization, a broadcast station for very, several broadcast stations for a very long time, he was not, as he often reminded us, a journalist. But as one close observer once noted, quote, he understood the instincts and behaviors of journalists better than most of them did themselves. Ansel wanted to inspire journalists who faced ethical challenges to make the right choice, even and especially when the right choice is a hard choice. And he did that by creating the Payne Award to celebrate journalists to uphold the highest standards of journalism, even when faced with personal, economic, or professional hardship 
and to encourage this and future generations of journalists to follow the example of Payne Award winners. And for all the students that are listening or watching us today or will in the future, um, I wanna just emphasize how important you, you are or were to, to Ansel. Um, I wanna take a moment to once again thank Ansel who died in 2004, his wife Valerie, or his widow Valerie, his daughter Anne, her husband Jeff, and the entire Payne Barker family for the support of the Payne Award. With their support, we've been privileged to honor extraordinary journalists to exemplify the values that the Payne Award celebrates. So today we have a very special program. Uh, as you may all recall, last April was the beginning of, of the pandemic. And so we were not able to hold the scheduled 2020 Payne Award ceremony uh, last April. And so we have with us today the winners of the 2020 Payne Award, as well as the 2021 winners and three finalists from 2021. Um, as I think we have noted, but let me just remind you, the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be av made available to you via email after this live event if you are uh, registered, registered for the event. I also wanna note that the webinar is closed captioned. Uh, to enable closed captioning, captioning, simply click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and thanks so much to Carol from LNS Captioning for providing live captioning today. You can ask questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we're gonna try very hard to hold our our questions down a little bit so that we can make sure we get some of your questions in. Uh, and I also do wanna just give everyone a warning that uh, many of the stories we'll be discussing today deal with disturbing topics, including sexual assault, violence, racism, and slavery. Uh, so we will begin our conversation with, with, about journalism ethics with the 2020 Payne Award winners. In 2019, Injustice Watch, a nonpartisan, not-for-profit, multimedia journalism organization that conducts in-depth research exposing institutional failures that obstruct justice and equality, took on a project to publish and report on a database of 2,000 police officers in eight cities who posted racist, homophobic, xenophobic, misogynistic, or violence-promoting content on personal social media accounts. If that happens to be a fact that I find, every time I see it, I, I just find astonishing. Injustice Watch faced legal challenges that could have put it out of business. It was threatened with lawsuits. In fact, one lawsuit was just recently uh, decided in their favor. Uh, and they took care to carefully vet the information about any officer mentioned in the story, went to great lengths to make sure that what they were publishing was accurate information. The impact of the publication was profound. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the broadcast networks, cable news outlets, and hundreds of local news organizations picked up the Injustice Watch story and built on it. As a result, police officials and departments around the country reviewed Facebook posts and hundreds of officers were disciplined, including the firing of more than a dozen officers. Departments adopted new stronger policies on social media postings by their officers and many implemented enhanced sensitivity training. I encourage you at some point to take a look at the link to the series is, is in the chat to take a look and look at some of the impact that, that this, uh, that this, this uh, story had, this project had. So we begin our conversation about journalism ethics today with the 2020 Payne Award winners, uh, Emily Horner, a senior reporter, and Rick Tulski, the co-founder and editorial director of Injustice Watch. So I wanna welcome uh, both Emily and Rick into, into the room, as they say in Zoom world. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, glad to be here. Well, we're, we're so glad to have you if a year late. Um, so you had a very large database full of, of defamatory information. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you did to make sure that, that what you published was accurate information uh, and published in a context that was fair to the named officers? Yeah, um, I think, you know, one of the things when we started reporting on this project was taking a lot of care to, you know, do a lot of the work ourselves and not just look at, you know, what the particular officer was posting on their public personal Facebook page. 
um, but also looking at other things in the officers um, past, you know, we looked up lawsuits, many of the officers that were named in our first story, um, they had faced uh, civil rights allegations in in federal court. Um, and so, you know, we also we included that type of information. We requested records um, about, you know, disciplinary information that the, the officers had faced. And, um, you know, we also went to great lengths to try to reach the officers, give them an opportunity to respond, give the departments an opportunity to respond, um, you know, and, and clarify any of the, the posts that we were going to be writing about. So Emily, I, because because we have a a number of students in the audience, and and one thing students have a are sometimes very reluctant to do is make that call and and talk to the source. Tell us a little bit about calling an officer who was in a database saying that he or she had posted objectionable material, and and you know contacting that officer and and creating a relationship with that officer. Yes. Yeah, so we. None of the officers um, were interested in speaking with us for the story um, that we had tried to get in contact with. Um, I think I talked to one person over the phone. Um, the rest, you know, we reached out. I reached out a couple of different ways to try to get in touch with them. We sent certified letters to their homes. We sent certified letters to the department. We reached out through the department. I sent them messages on their Facebook pages um, that, you know, we were looking at in some of the instances. So, um, you know, it's definitely a nerve wracking thing to do. Um, you know, I remember, I'm sure I was feeling nervous doing it even then, because you know, you're going to ruin someone's day, probably they're not going to be very happy with what you have to say to them. Um, but you, you have to do everything you can to you know, give them an opportunity to, you know, say what these posts mean or explain themselves or um, whatever. So it's it's so important that even though it is, um, you know, nerve wracking, I think it's vital. It's obviously, you know, a very ethical stuff you need to take um, when you're reporting out stories like this. Tim, can I add a word to that, which is, it's not only the fair thing to do, and it's not only the right thing to do, your story becomes better if you can find out from the person you're writing about what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what made them do what you're writing about. So it's journalistically better to get both sides. Well, uh, let, let, let's let's follow up on that a little bit in a, in a slightly different way, and and that is, um, you know, there's this there's this ongoing debate about the place of objectivity in journalism, right? Yeah. And um, you guys, uh, you have a clear point of view. You are an investigative news team group, um, and you have certain assumptions about the way the world works, right? Uh, how does how does objectivity, that whole notion, how does that fit into the framework of a of an investigative journalism unit? Okay, so I've been a reporter a long time, and I've worked for many legacy places. I worked for years at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the LA Times. And I wrote a lot about court systems that didn't work right, about police that misbehaved. Anytime I'm doing a project, I'm not looking at cases of alleged police brutality because I want to prove the police acted properly. I pick my topics to try to expose a problem. Um, I heard the Dean introduce the whole thing today saying one of the things about great reporting is shedding a light on corruption and abuse. And that's a bias going in that, that you're going to prove something wrong. On the other hand, once you're doing it, what's really, really important is that you do it fairly and accurately and do everything you can to make sure you've gotten both sides and that you are right and fair in exposing the wrong. Um, so while picking the topic and 
what motivates you to pick what you pick. There is a bias built in that you want to make the world better um, and you want to expose something wrong. But once you start doing it, you've got to do everything you can to be fair and even handed um, in the treatment of it in large part because it's not as credible if you write it with a slant. So, so taking that into the, out of the ethical domain for a moment and into the legal domain, um, you published this, you know, you went into this story and you published it knowing that there was a potential that it could, you could be facing serious legal bills. <laughs> That this could be, there could be pretty serious litigation coming out of this um, that could that could destroy your organization. I mean, you know, you're, it's not you don't have deep deep pockets, right? right. Um, so, two questions. One, how did how did how did if at all did you know as you're going into this story and you've got this database and you're figuring, okay, we're going to publish this and it's it's going to it's it's going to shake some say shake some trees. Um, how does the legal calculation fit? with sort of the ethical imperative that you just described? I mean, how do you balance those? How do you balance those two? So one of the things about being a small nonprofit organization is to get exposure, you partner with bigger places. So our stuff is run in all kinds of newspapers and TV stations and places. And when we took it to one major publication, seeing if they would co-publish it with us, um, they would only do it if we were willing to take out all the names of the officers and make it anonymous. Um, so even big places were afraid of the story. Uh, we knew there was a giant risk of getting sued and we, Injustice Watch lost its insurance carrier over it, even though we won the lawsuit because we're considered a high risk place because we do it. But to my mind, the whole point of being in business is to stand up and expose what's wrong and speak truth to power. And if you're not willing to take that risk, there's no point in doing the work. A little overstated, but not a lot. So the so the suit, I mean, you w was dismissed because the uh, uh, failure to be able to prove actual malice. But that's pretty deep into the process. I mean, that's that's not a short, that's that's not a a, a one one thing filed and you're done. Um, it took uh, it took going. They filed suit in federal district court in Philadelphia. Um, the suit sat there for months with both sides filing briefs. When the judge ruled, uh, dismissed the complaint, which is a pretty early step, it then got appealed to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. More money, more time, more expense. Um, all, you know, legally, there was no actual malice in the case. And there wasn't actually anything wrong that we did. Um, but to get to that point, it's, it's not as simple as one might think reading New York Times versus Sullivan. <laughs> well, so it's been a, it's been a year um, uh, since, since we would have first visited with you. Uh, can you give us, or Emily, can you give us a, an update on what's going on with Injustice Watch and what you all are doing now? Um, yeah, I think we are still, you know, working on some big projects. Um, we have one of the, the big things that we did in the last year, Rick also played a big part of, um, and so did I with the circuit, we have 20 years worth of criminal court data. Um, from Cook County, which is the, the county that includes Chicago and a couple um, suburban areas around it. Um, and so we've been writing about um, the, you know, the data in, in that 
all of the criminal cases, um, what has been happening in courtrooms. Um, you know, our first stories were about two judges um, who attorneys were repeatedly trying to avoid practicing before them. Um, so we're, we're still, you know, working on stories, trying to hold people um, in positions of power accountable in, when it involves the criminal justice system. So, so what was the, what's the outcome of, of uh, in plain view that, that you're most proud of? Um, for me, I would say um, there, I, I've never worked on a story before that has had so much impact and led to so much change. Um, I'm not sure I will work on another story that has so much impact and led to so much change. You know, um, it's not just like the, the discipline that um, happened in the departments, but also you know, in Philadelphia, there were there were having conversations um, about the relationship between the communities and the police. Um, and you know, this was a year before last summer, um, when after the George, George Floyd was killed. And so I think, yeah, I mean, there was just a, a lot of change that happened. I wrote about some other. Um, stories that kind of spun off of that still looking at Facebook and um, you know all of that has been really rewarding to see you know it's good to see you, the work that you do hopefully make a positive difference um, in you know the system that exists. And that doesn't always happen and it doesn't happen quickly um, and so one of the things as a reporter you have to do is keep at it don't give up and push push, push. So Rick, was there, was there something um, as you were working through this story uh, and, and, you know, this whole project, um, what surprised you? Um, so you often hear that um, when there's a problem with the police department, the knee jerk reaction is, oh, it's just a few bad apples. And I think what Emily and I were told by many people was what we actually showed was this was more than a few bad apples. This was a big deal. And I think it got so much attention because of that. We, we, Often what journalism involves is proving something important that everybody knows, but they've never been able to actually prove. And so um, it was satisfying and rewarding and unusual to have a situation where you're able to do that. And um, the reaction and the results, it's been great. It's what we're in the business to do. So, um... I want to kind of follow up on that because uh, I mean a number of the stories that we're celebrating today, a number of the projects that we're celebrating, are in one way or another dealing with systemic issues. Mm -hmm. You know, so did but did so did you go? I mean, I'm trying to from what you were just saying, did you go into this thinking, well, this is a systemic issue we're going to look at, or did you go in thinking, well, there are these some of these bad apples around that we need to we need to put a highlight on, you know, put a put a spotlight on. So. In my days in Philadelphia, I worked for a genius of an editor named Gene Roberts. And Gene's theory of how you do great journalism was pretty simple. Anytime you see something outrageous, ask if it's an isolated case or part of a pattern. And if you can show the pattern, you're doing much more important work. And so that's guided me through many things, including Plainview Project. So we have we have um, we have time for at least one audience question here. So, uh, uh, has the work on on in plain view had any impact on your personal lives, either positively or negatively? Emily, you go. Um, I can say that I learned a lot of things about um, the conversations that happen on Facebook. Um, and it has, 
I do not personally use Facebook anymore. After reporting on these stories, I'm very uninterested in being part of the Facebook community um, because it was a lot to um, be, you know, I think like we're always in our own you know, little echo chambers that's, there's been studies about this, you know, our Facebook friends are like us and we, you know, have conversations with people that are like us. Um, and so I was kind of introduced to a different world. And yeah, I think um, I would say not a total fan of the Facebook social media. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have a Facebook anymore, basically after all this. <laughs> I'll give a different answer on her behalf, which is I've known Emily for years. She was one of the first people to join in Justice Watch. She has always done good, solid work. She's tenacious. And I've known this for years, but this story gave the chance for a lot more people to discover just how good a reporter she is. That's great. That's great. Um, so I have one. I have one last question for you guys. Uh, I mean, you you know, this is a story that was published in, you know, more than a year ago, and you've been working on it prior to that. And over the last year, um, we've had the profound experience of of the Black Lives Matters and social justice conversation that's been going on. Do you think that if you were doing this story today, that it, that it would be have been influenced in any way by this important conversation that we're in the midst of? Uh, I don't know if we would have or not, and I'll, I'm interested to hear what Rick thinks um, too, but I think, you know, we focused on, there was a lot of things in the database and it was, you know, we kind of covered everything that was in there. There were like posts that mocked due process. There were, um, you know, posts that use dehumanizing language. There were, um, you know, people posting pictures of Confederate flags. There were racism, sexism, you know, it, it really ran the gambit. Um, and so like, I may have been inclined to focus a little bit more on um, the white supremacy posts, but I don't know. I, you know, I think like the, the, reporting that we did is still very relevant to everything, you know, that has gone on. So what Emily did in the reporting was take what people were saying and look up what they were doing on the streets through lawsuits and complaints. And, and we were able to tie words with action. And there was an officer in Philadelphia as one of many examples who posted something saying, I would have tased that guy um, about somebody who had been a taser victim somewhere. And this guy, as he said it, was facing a lawsuit for his misuse of taser on a citizen of Philadelphia. And so what we saw in the lawsuits was the kind of bad conduct that we're seeing people complain about on the streets. And the one thing Emily didn't mention is there is a US House subcommittee that had a hearing following the George Floyd stuff. And they're thinking about police reform. And they're thinking about how what we found in our study impacts what they're going to recommend. Well, I, I wish we had a lot more time because this uh, we could continue this conversation and perhaps we'll have the opportunity someplace at some time down the road, actually in person. Um, but Rick and Emily, congratulations on your, your 2020 Pain Award and, and thanks so much for, for spending time with us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you. So we're now going to move on to shorter conversations with three of our 2021 finalists. Um, again, we're, we don't, these are going to be pretty short, so we're not going to have a whole lot of time for questions, but please do submit. And we'll, we'll certainly try to get into them uh, as time permits. So our first <laughs> finalist today is <laughs> and producers and from the Washington Post for the series Canary. 
Uh, and this is the first ever podcast series recognized as a Payne Award finalist. Uh, and again, I want to give everybody the warning that this is a this is a story that that deals with themes of sexual assault. Uh, in a seven part podcast, Canary, the Washington Post investigates. This team explored the decisions of two women to share their accounts of sexual assault and the spiraling consequences of those choices. Canary revealed systemic problems within the criminal justice system that illustrate how difficult it is for survivors to feel any sense of justice. The reporters and producers working on this story were very aware that the subjects of the podcast were vulnerable people who were sharing very private moments. Their nomination described the decisions made as part of a larger philosophy of what they called, quote, radical transparency. That is, there was no artificial suspense built into the podcast. There was no use of sound design to raise heart rates. In other words, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a movie. Um, in short, their intention was to protect their sources and let the facts carry the narrative. When the podcasts were in rough draft, they put together a focus group in the newsroom to listen to the episodes and provide feedback to ensure they were handling the subject matter with the utmost respect, sensitivity, and professionalism. Then they held Zoom sessions with that same group to go over the material yet again. Uh, there is a link in the uh, in, in the chat to that um, so you can subscribe to the podcast, and I strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, with us today are Amy Britton, the audio the investigative reporter on the story, and audio producer Bishop Sand. So thanks for being with us today, Amy and Bishop. Thank you. So. Um, you, you do this very well in the podcast, but many, most of the people who are watching today probably haven't seen the podcast or watched, listened to it. Can you tell us how this project came to be? What was the starting point? Why was it a podcast? I mean, what, what made it a podcast as opposed to, you know, a long investigative Sunday story or something? What, what, why did we go this direction as opposed to the other direction? Um, so kind of give us that, give us that background. Sure, thanks Tim for having us. We really appreciate it. So the story started when I wrote an article in 2019 about a woman who had been jogging in DC when she was sexually assaulted. Uh, this was a traditional print story. It was about 5,000 words, and it focused on lapses in the criminal justice system um, that led to a disappointing result for the survivor of the sexual assault in the case, whose name is Lauren Clark. And after the story, I thought I was done. I actually have a ritual after most of my stories where I clean off my desk, I get out the Clorox wipes, I put away all the files, and I did that. And then I got an email uh, one day from a woman in Birmingham, Alabama, who said that she had information that was directly relevant to the story that I had just published. And I called this woman, uh, Carol Griffin is her name, she's a baker. And essentially she told me on that initial phone call that she wasn't sure if she wanted this information to ever become public, but she wanted me to know that there was key information about the story I had just published. Uh, and that information was that the judge in the sexual assault case who had given a 10 day sentence to a man who had attacked multiple women in DC, that this judge had sexually assaulted her when she was a 16 year old girl uh, decades earlier. So at that point, um, you know, I think there was a clear path for me, maybe a more traditional path where I just could have interviewed her and written a follow-up print story, but I really wanted to go to Alabama to meet her. And I made a, a key decision in the beginning of that effort to take um, this with me. I don't normally bring props, but I have one here, which is a, a Zoom uh, professional recorder. And uh, Bishop, who is the producer, and Rena Flores, who is the eventual producer on Canary, trained me on how to use that. And I went to Alabama and I spent the whole weekend with Carol um, hearing about her story, uh, discussing potentially if she wanted to go forward with this information on the record. And I came back with hours and hours of tape. And I felt like um, there was really something special here, but I didn't know what the path forward would look like because the Post had never done an investigative podcast before. We didn't really have a, a, a pathway forward for this in the newsroom that had already been defined. So I consulted with Rena. She listened to the tape. She described it as a treasure trove. And we made the decision to try to pitch it as a podcast and to continue recording the reporting process. Um, so the, the, the strengths were apparent to me initially, which was the intimacy, um, the ability to kind of connect with these individuals in a way that you could never connect with them through print. 
Uh, but the, the decision to go forward with the podcast also came with a tremendous amount of risk that we had to navigate through. So let's let's talk a little bit about your your editorial review process, which um, I, I, the pain award judges were were quite taken with um, and impressed by. Um, why? I mean, I, I've never heard of this kind of a in depth process and focus groups and you know ever with, with a print story. Um, why? Why? What, what, why did was this process developed for this particular project? And what did you all learn from it? And, and is it something the Post is going to continue to use, do you think? Yeah, well, we, we developed this because it's such an emotionally charged subject and audio gets to those emotions. It's just like this, you know, you're just hardwired into it. And, you know, in audio, this isn't really all that uncommon. We do this all the time. We have these sessions, we call them getting fresh ears on it. Um, and what the idea is, is just to get an idea of what is, what is a general public going to hear when they hear this? And so we brought in colleagues, we had reporters and editors from all, all across the room so they could be emotionally distant. Um, they weren't in on the project with us. Uh, yeah, you see the, the photos of all of them here. And this is one of our Zoom sessions. Um, for this process, we had a, just a, a wide variety of, of, uh, of colleagues and we, uh, we had them listen to two episodes at a time, we had them keep, keep it confidential, confidential. Um, and we had them fill out these surveys, things like, what did you find, um, you know, what stuck out to you? What do you think about the scene at, you know, 17 minutes in? What do you think about um, wh what dragged, what didn't, and so forth? And then we would take those responses, and Amy and Rena, the other producer on this, and I, we would kind of sort through them and frame them into these, these conversations with these people, these cold listeners. And it would get really animated and it would get like sometimes heated um, <laughs> and it would always be like it, it, it would also be like moving at times because you would realize that there's a deeper theme that we were, we were kind of like just getting into, but we needed just to sharpen something else a little bit more. And so what those did is they, they, they gave us these, these great, um, this great backstop to let us know that we were making the right decisions and how to tell the story from an audio perspective, because these are people who had never heard this before, were not a part of the project and they were hearing for the first time. Um, so if it worked for them, then it would work for the rest of the audience. Um, and I, you know, for audio, of course, we're gonna use this again because we always use this sort of thing. But for print, Amy's actually working on this. To yeah, yeah, I, I wanna definitely find a way to, to try to replicate it in print. Cause I think sometimes we get so deep into the, <laughs> into the forest that we can't find our way out sometimes. And it really helps to have that process of people who have no stake in the story, who just wanna help you tell the most powerful story. So one, I'm gonna throw a big question at you. And with, you know, um, this, is, this is audio. So, you know, you got 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the radical transparency and, and how that, that whole concept um, affected the people who experience these stories? I mean, how, do, how does that, rela that relationship to the sources and this whole notion of radical transparency? Yeah, so when we say that, you know, sometimes when I listen to podcasts as a listener, I get the sense that, you know, they're going dun 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 dun, dun you know, to build the suspense or something. And we realized that we didn't need to do that because this is such an organic, natural journey. There's natural suspense there. And also these are real human beings. These are real lives. And, and we don't need to manufacture anything or create anything. The stakes are high enough as it is to come forward as a victim of sexual assault, especially to do so in such a, a, a platform you know, in the, as the Washington Post. So when we talk about radical transparency, uh, that's it's twofold, I think. One is for the public, for explaining to them what we're doing, why we're doing it, why we're reaching out to corroborating witnesses, why we're asking for documents, why we're going to someone for comment. But it's also radical transparency to the sources, to let them know what they're getting into when they're agreeing to move forward with us um, in the process of reporting an investigative podcast. And there's a moment really quick in episode five where uh, I'm having this conversation with Carol, and she considers 
uh, backing out of the, the story because it's just become too much for her in this moment. And, and we decided to air that conversation. And that's a conversation I think that is typically such a confidential process, uh, process of the reporting journey. And, and I, we've gotten so much good feedback from listeners who have heard that and really felt like it was a window into a process that they had never had visibility into previously. Wow. Well, um, again, I hate to stop this conversation, but uh, we're on a clock. So Amy <laughs> uh, Bishop, <laughs> thank you so much for, for joining us today. Congratulations on being a finalist and just um, uh, great work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and congratulations to the other winners and finalists. Great work. We now move on to our next group of the two, 2021 finalists. Uh, <clears throat> This was a story, a number of stories. It's become a project about a major state university, its School of Journalism and New Media, its dean of that school, and powerful white donors who operated in a culture that secretly tolerated racism while publicly condemning it. After receiving thousands of emails and other documents from transparent Ole Miss, a group of anonymous whistleblowers who had obtained them from the University of Mississippi in a public records request, the Mississippi Free Press newsroom faced the dilemma of balancing the need to protect the whistleblower's identity uh, and, and the identities of other sources while accurately reporting on Ole Miss. It faced significant pressure from within the university, uh, including from within the School of Journalism uh, and New Media, and across the state. There is, um, again, the story, the link is, is, is in the chat, and we, we encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, today, we have with us uh, reporter Ashton Pittman and Mississippi Free Press editor and executive director Donna Ladd. Um, and I welcome, welcome both of you. Uh, and I should note, uh, for those of you who haven't looked at the story yet, that this is an ongoing, I mean, I think the most recent story posted is from March of this year. So um, this is a story with a lot of legs uh, and, and, it, and uh, it keeps on going. Um, so let's just begin, let's tell us your experience when, when this tranche of emails arrived in your newsroom. You know, what challenges did you see in reporting the story uh, and how did, you, how did you move forward with it? Thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here alongside all these other winners. Um, it, our work, um, it started out, honestly, uh, Donna messaged me, she had gotten a tip and I looked at it and she said, hey, do you think you could do a story on this? And I was like, yeah, give me a day or so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because we just had a, a one you know, little string of emails. Uh, and so I didn't take time to really look at it and figure out what it was. But once I did, it, it started just unfolding. So I messaged the uh, whistleblowers who had reached out to us. And I said, hey, do you have any anything else? I would you know, like more context. Suddenly, I have thousands and thousands of emails and documents being shared with me. and uh, you know, we we kind of have this four month uh, period of working on it. Um, you know, the, the the challenges with this uh, were really about you know first of all we had to ensure the emails were authentic uh, because you know you get them from an anonymous whistleblower you 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 have to you know really look into it. So we were able to do uh, to uh, verify them uh, through the metadata. Um, but then there was also you know the issue of well we first of all the our first source on this is someone not only who is anonymous, you know, is going to be anonymous to our readers, but who is anonymous to us. Uh, so the challenge then was finding people we could talk to whose identity we did know, um, who could corroborate and give us information. Um, and it was also, you know, the, another challenge with that was, you know, we have to be sensitive to the fact that it's, it became clearer and clearer as we were going through this, that there's kind of a culture of, uh, of fear at the university. Um, among, especially among faculty who feel like, uh, you know, speaking out uh, could endanger their jobs. Um, and, and, you know, the first person that told us this, that's one thing. But once you, you know, keep hearing that over and over, uh, you start to realize there really is this, this concern. So it was being sensitive uh, to that, um, the corroborating the emails, and honestly, just contextualizing these thousands of documents you suddenly have that you know, at first, I didn't understand what I was looking at in a lot of cases. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was a uh, it was a it was a big deal and a big process. Um, and there were lots of ethical considerations, but um, 
I'm really proud of what we ended up producing. Let me add to what? that. May I add to that? The yeah, one absolutely. Thing, it, the, the important, one important thing to understand here is that um, it, th there was a cover up involved as well. It's kind of complicated. I urge you to read the stories to fully understand it. But this was uh, almost two years after an earlier incident known as the Ed Meek incident. And um, that had been wrapped up into a neat package at that point. But what we found out, we got a faculty recording and some other things that basically showed that, that there were people who knew the real identity of the, of the person who had done these disgusting uh, photographs and videos of students and been passing them back and forth with the Dean of the Journalism School. And so my point there is that there had already kind of been over the last almost two years, kind of this effort to out who had provided that recording in the first place. And, uh, and the emails themselves showed how much uh, even people within the journalism school were trying to go after people who had revealed some things two years before. That's complicated, but the point is the emails themselves showed us the dangers that people were facing, particularly faculty within the journalism school when we went to them and tried to do the story. So it was this kind of very layered problem that we had to deal with. So, and, and in some ways, and, and you know, anybody who, is, who has looked at, at your publications would think this is a silly question that I'm gonna ask you. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, and, as was the case with Injustice Watch, I mean, you guys are, you know, not for profit, you don't have deep pockets, you're not, you know, big teams of lawyers, um, taking on a major state institution, powerful figures. Uh, why didn't you just say, oh, we'll let this one go? And because you weren't the only ones with the emails, right? So we'll just let this one yeah. go and see how it plays out. Well, the first thing I want to say there, just in case, uh, depending on who's watching out there, make no mistake, we have good attorneys who support us. <laughs> I just want that to be clear that we're not, uh, some people assume we don't and then they learn that we do. Um, uh, well, this, it was um, certainly, it, it, it was daunting. It's a daunting project. We don't have deep pockets. We were only a couple months old. I mean, I've run a newspaper here for two, for 20 years, but the nonprofit was only a couple months old. And we knew that we would anger people um, and who might, that we might need to support our nonprofit, you know, graduates of the University of Mississippi, for instance. Um, but the bottom line is that Ashton and I, we'd already been working together at my previous newspaper. We're not in journalism for approval um, or to keep people comfortable. Um, this was a systemic cover up that had far reaching implications both inside the journalism school and across the university and thus the state. And there was no way for us not to report it. I just wanna make that clear. I, uh, I think it was Rick who said this earlier, this is why we're doing this, right? And so where I would never have, have slept was knowing that in, uh, by the end of August that young women, particularly young black women were gonna be coming back to campus in the fall and have the, some of the same powerful men walking around taking their photos and passing them among their older friends calling these these young women hookers and other things um, that had to be exposed and it couldn't be hidden um, that's why we're here and so we just decided to do this work and Ashton I have to say Ashton did the reporting I helped make the decisions and to watch our backs and bring in the attorneys uh, and those you know and other things and edit but um, it was hard work um, but we we believe firmly that it's worth it even though as you said the story's still going on so I, I, I I'd like to um, uh, I'd like Don I'd like you to to elaborate on something I, you, you sure. said in an earlier conversation we had, and that is sure. a phrase that I just loved, which was do the right thing and wait. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, 20 years ago when, when uh, my partner Todd, who's my life partner too, uh, started the uh, Jackson Free Press, you know, the Iraq war hit and people were going, uh, you know, we were getting all these attempted boycotts because we were against the Iraq war. I mean, all these things. 
and you know, and we were small and we didn't have much money. And um, poor Todd would, you know, he was the publisher, so he wouldn't sleep. But the phrase, but it always worked out because we always got more supporters as a result of it, which this, which happened here too, um, it, because our Oxford support blew up. You know, professors, we have the royalties from one uh, one professor outside of journalism schools from his textbooks now, um, and uh, so so I've been said Todd started saying then do the right thing and wait, you know do the right thing and wait, and so that's what we we did here is that we felt like we, we did the right thing and waited, and it's so far so good. So we do have uh, I think time for one one audience question. Um, can you describe the process of responding to, to specific criticisms through editor's notes? Sure. Um, I, I have, uh, there, my editor's note is part of that. Um, and it's a fairly lengthy editor's note. And this started publishing um, in, a, in, the, for, in a series. And so what ended up happening is that we immediately got some rather surprising pushback from journalism, some, from some journalism professors I knew including discrediting of the uh, of the the black woman professor former professor who went on the record um, but discrediting without any evidence and it was really awful so and so all of this stuff started up that was about discrediting us which surprised us a little bit especially out of the journalism school instead of focusing on what was really happening so i just started an editor's note over that first week when we kept dropping the initial stories um, and collecting the criticism like you know why did you why did you quote that part of the faculty recording that you were provided that should have been confidential it's like well because two years before you know it was reported but nobody reported this part you know this important part um, so i just kept responding to it and so that's um we we believed that our process that we should be very transparent about the decisions that we made that were difficult decisions like why we went with why we uh, um, we were okay with we call them the orwells which will uh, make sense to you if you read the series but the orwells wh who were the whistleblowers why it was okay with us not to know their identities uh short answer is that the emails were real regardless but and things all of those kinds of things that people and they were in the beginning they were just throwing it at us it was just like garbage you know to try to to try to dis discredit us and i think that that had the effect sadly of of scaring off other media to the story to this day through all of the attacks on the ombudsman which you can read about and all of this that try to out the whistleblowers not one other reporter in the state of Mississippi has touched the story. Well, I have had a few say that, or at least one say that they knew about it. And we do mm -hmm. have emails showing that other outlets did receive uh, the emails. And these are outlets that had reported on the Edme conflict, but never went back after our stories came out and after they got the emails to note that they had only told half the story. So. Well, I, again, I'd love to continue this conversation, but uh, we need to move on. So Donna and Ashton, thank you so much. Congratulations on being a finalist and thank, uh, you. thank you for such great work. It means the world to us. Thank you so much, Tim. So we will now uh, move on to the last finalist discussion. And uh, <clears throat> this is a story, uh, an Associated Press uh, project uh, that I want to note was funded in part by the McGraw Center for Business Journalism at uh, Cooney's Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Mason, uh, Margie Mason and uh, Robin McDowell, who, are, who were our 2016 Payne Award winners for their Seafood of, from Slaves uh, series, uh, spent more than two years reporting the Fruits of Labor series, which was this year's finalist. They interviewed children and palm workers who had been trafficked, enslaved, abused, and raped. Throughout the difficult reporting process, the one thing that remained most important to the reporters, even more important than getting the story, was protecting the workers at all costs. It was a pressure that weighed on them throughout their reporting. And I think it's worth noting that this was not protecting the, the, their sources from some sort of mild harassment. This was literally protecting them 
for their lives. The AP interviewed more than three dozen women and girls from at least 12 com com companies across Indonesia and Malaysia. Because previous reports have resulted in retaliation against workers they identified only by partial names or nicknames. They met with female AP reporters secretly with their, within their barracks or at hotels, coffee shops, or churches, sometimes late at night, usually with no men present so they could speak openly. The reporters also interviewed nearly 200 other workers, activists, government officials, and lawyers, including some who had helped the trapped girls and women escape, who confirmed that these abuses regularly occurred. Again, the, the link to the story is in the chat, and uh, please, please feel free to give us uh, some questions. So we have with us today uh, Margie Mason, photo, and then photojournalist Robin McDowell, mm -hmm. and then uh, Kristen Gasly, the editor on the story. So Morgan, Robin, Kristen, thank you for being with us, and good afternoon. Thank you for having us. First out, I'm just going to do an AP write through. Um, Robin is. Um, Thank God, she's a reporter, not a photojournalist, because otherwise oh. I would be on my own here with the reporting. Um, well, you know, and, and, I, and I knew that. That's okay. We, we do I know, but I read what I, you know, time. I apologize, I apologize, <laughs> I apologize, Rob. Um, I, I just want to say first off, you know, um, you know, how honored we are, um, you know, to have, um, to have um, been selected as the finalist this year, um, especially after being selected in 2016 for the Seafood from Slaves project. So thank you so, so very much. Well, thank you. I mean, thank you for your work and, and for all that you guys have been doing for all these many years. Um, and I, my, my first question to you is uh, really kind of why? Why do you do this work? I mean, this is a, a massive, complicated, dangerous, international story. Um, why'd you take it on and why'd you stay with it? Um, you know, I think um, with, with, you know, and I guess I can talk about both of these projects really, um, you know, Robin and I tend to gravitate toward what we call open secrets. Um, these are, you know, stories that are really just there for the taking. Um, you know, and I think that oftentimes what happens is, um, you know, it might be a topic that somebody will say, well, that's been written about, or that's old. And, you know, an editor might discourage, um, you know, a reporter from, from um, pursuing it, or other reporters even, you know, have said to us, these are old, uh, you know, stories. And I think that, um, you know, you take these stories and you kind of maybe turn them upside down and try to look at, um, you know, something that may or may not be known about, um, say, the palm oil industry. And, and granted, um, you know, we joke and say that um, when you say palm oil, um, you know, people would ask us what we were doing and we would be at dinner parties and it was like, oh, we don't even want to bring this up because your eyes just glaze over at the mere mention of palm oil. But I think, um, once you start to say something like, well, you know, I found this little girl and um, she was 10 years old and she had to drop out of the fourth grade to help her father um, meet these impossibly high quotas that his company set every day on this Indonesian plantation. And then we were able to show that the fruit she was harvesting was actually making its way into the supply chains of the companies and the bakeries that were making um, Girl Scout cookies and being sold here in America. I think at that point, it becomes a little more um, interesting for people. And I think that's really what our job is. You know, this is a very, um, you know, everything is connected uh, in, in, in the world and with all the globalization. I think you know, our job really is to show these connections and to make them resonate with people. And I think once you make people care about something, that's when the pressure comes. And when the pressure comes, that's when the change comes. And I think that, you know, when Robin and I choose a project to go in on, and we really go in, um, as our editor can tell you, uh, you know, we're, we go in for the long haul and it's slow and there's not um, usually a lot of data to guide us. We don't have records. It's very kind of grassroots, 
you know, um, very much kind of old school, oftentimes shoe leather reporting, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. But but then I think again, you know, the main thing that we try to do is to shine a light on something, and in this case, it's the palm oil industry, and to really educate people about something that they might not know about and show how it connects to them and how um, you know, their buying habits are fueling this type of abuse. So, um, I mean, this story illustrated it and your, your, your uh, earlier Payne Award winning story illustrated it and, and also a number of other Associated Press entries I've, that I've seen uh, both in this and in other, in other contexts have demonstrated them. The AP has a really well-established process for looking at and dealing with ethical questions. And I was wondering if, if one of you could talk a little bit about that process and, and how it works, especially going into, you know, not when you're in the middle of the story, but as you go into a, a, a serious, complicated uh, project like this. Well, it starts at the outset um, when you know you're talking to people who are putting themselves in danger just for sharing their stories, decisions about what we're going to do about naming them. Um, our policy is to grant anonymity only as a last resort, uh, to not, we don't use pseudonyms. So it's how do you tell these people stories, protect them, but also not make readers think, well, you're just making it up. You're not naming any of these people. And we had to walk the line throughout of what details can we put in the story that bring home these are real people that aren't so identifying that these plantations will go after them. And we had endless discussions and often we took something out of a story with it was a wonderful detail that we thought could reverberate on the person who had the courage to talk to Margie and Robin. Um, we also had, uh, a lot of experience from the seafood slaves things of dealing with people in transit. The main character in our first story uh, bolted the plantation and was on the road trying to get home, calling us desperate. And our decision was, do we help him? And we had a lot of discussions about that. And we, ascent, we eventually put him in contact with um, the, the, the migrant international organization that called him a victim of trafficking. And we disclose that in the story. If we're going to do that, we're going to be honest about it. But that's really one of the joys of working with Robin and Margie is how seriously they take all this. They want to get the hardest story possible, but protect the humans involved. So Kristen, I mean, is there a, is there a checklist or is there a, or is this just you've been doing, you all have been doing this so long that they're, you know, how, how defined is the system that leads or shapes these, these discussions that you're having? It's shaped by experience. You know, every story can't have the, have the same checklist, but we really, we wanna be, the, the checklist, if it's, you know, it'd be small, be transparent, be as solid as you can, but also, you know, again, you know, the, the, the risk these people took in talking to us cannot be minimized. And you know they already are in terrible situations, and we did not want to do anything to make it worse. So I'm I'm being told that we have no time for any audience questions, um, which I'm very sorry to have to report. Uh, and I'm think I'm guessing somebody needs to tell me: Are we out of time here? Is there? Are we... Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So yes, we are out of time, um, and I, I, I just uh, so many things we'd like. I'd like to talk to you guys about. Uh, but again, thank you so much for for the work that you do. Congratulations on being a finalist, uh, and I know we all look forward to the next the next long, complicated story investigation that um, that that you two uh, take on. So thank you very much for being with us today. And congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we now move on to uh, our last session for the day, and that is 
our winner of the 2021 Ansel Payne Award for Ethics in Journalism. Uh, and the winner is the Anchorage Daily News uh, and ProPublica. Uh, in 2018, the Anchorage Daily News asked readers if they would share stories, their stories of sexual violence to help determine why sexual assault and murder cases in Alaska were increasing in numbers and severity. More than 200 people responded. The news staff partnered with ProPublica's local reporting network to publish Unheard, a compilation of 29 stories from women and men speaking about their experiences with sexual assault. The judges in reviewing this work noted a number of qualities that distinguished it and it, at the end of the day uh, made it our Payne Award winner. First was the, the degree to which this, this project gave voice to unrepresented communities. In, in, in Alaska. And while much of the discussion focused on the native Alaskan community, uh, the people profiled in, in this report include a, a, a really diverse population, uh, quite honestly, probably a more diverse population than many of us in the lower 48 would, would imagine. Um, and we, they, the, the, the judges were extremely um, taken by that. Uh, the project gave agency to the survivors and allowed individuals to tell their own stories. There was a very deliberate and careful ethical decision-making process. The photo subjects were empowered, which is to say that the, the photo subjects, the, they, had a, they had a voice in determining how the photos were going to be shot and where they were going to be shot. The story included male and female victims. There was a, there was a humanitarian perspective and feel to this, to this report. Uh, it was a very human story. And, and as a result, what you received, what you saw and what are portrayed in this story are, are really fully formed uh, individuals telling, telling uh, about uh, tragic parts of their lives. Um, we wanna highlight that this project was a collaboration between the paper and ProPublica's local reporting network. Uh, and it is evidence of the value of this collaborative model between for-profit and not-for-profit, for for profit and not-for-profit journalism uh, that is becoming increasingly common. Again, there is a link to the story. Uh, and we ask you, we, we do I hope that you will give us some questions. With us today are Kyle Hopkins, the editor on the story, um, Ann Rapp, the photographer from the Anchor Daily News, and Adriana uh, Galadaro, the engagement reporter with ProPublica. And you can also see on the screen the entire uh, Alaska Daily News and ProPublica team that worked on this story. Um, so the first, first question that I have for you all is when you, when you ask the readers to share their stories, uh, did you ask the question thinking this was a story about uh, systemic inequality uh, or did, this, did the data, the stories you heard in the official data lead you to conclusions about systemic problems after you, after you started looking at it? Um, uh, hi everybody, I'm, I'm Kyle Hopkins, um, thanks for inviting us to talk. Um, we started in 2018, we were doing, um, you know, the paper had come out of bankruptcy. We were looking to do some enterprise reporting, um, you know, and I think we're, you know, I, I was looking at doing stories that, you know, I was going to feel like we had just been putting off for, for some time. And, and meantime, in that kind of fall 2018 period, there were some really high profile sexual assault cases um, the Kavanaugh hearings were happening and I'd written a story, um, you know, one of those kind of long simmering stories was about, um, you know, a, a group of police officers who uh, had been convicted of sex crimes or domestic violence and really should not have been working as police, but had been, you know, were kind of wearing a badge and, and operating in their communities and, and committing new crimes, committing new sexual assaults. Um, and so as we started, you know, that story led to, you um, to tips about other police departments uh, in like rural hubs in Alaska where sex crimes were being reported, but then they were being ignored, right? And so, you know, we did two or three stories and um, and then did a call out because, you know, we had always assumed, you know, Alaska has the highest rate of sexual assault in the country. And we'd always assumed, you know, maybe wrongly that it was something that people didn't really want to talk about. You know, it was hard to get people to talk about uh, these issues for, you know, as sources. And so, um, but there was something about that time frame, or maybe it's just because we hadn't asked in the right way before 
but you know, we did a call out around that time and we found we were just kind of flooded with responses. And, you know, one of the questions in the call out is, would you talk to a reporter? You know, would you be willing to tell your story publicly? And, and we were surprised to find that almost everybody, everybody was willing to do that. So in, in, in putting together the story, I mean, it was certainly our impression that um, the relationship that, that your team developed with your sources and the subjects of the story was a little different than, than you know, kind of your standard news story. That there was an effort to um, really allow the voice of, of, your, of your subjects to come through and not be a report about them, but rather let them speak. Um, was that a conscious decision? And if so, how was it made? And, uh, and did, it, did it create any challenges in terms of the reporting and editing of the story? Sure, I think I can, I can take that question. Um, and thank you for having us. We're, we're so, so grateful and so impressed by everyone here tonight. Um, the project Unheard came on the tails of, uh, Kyle had been reporting by the point that we joined Lawless um, independently through the partnership that ProPublica and, and the ADN had created. Um, we had an interest in my department, which is the engagement department at ProPublica, to create a project that centered the victims and the survivors of sexual assault in Alaska in a way that really was true to the, what we were learning from the 200 stories that Kyle had collected before we were partners. Um, and so I was given a spreadsheet with the stories and I was just stunned at the volume of sexual assault that a single person had, would experience. That felt very unusual and very different than the sexual assault stories that, that we had read about and that the Me Too movement had highlighted. We were talking about people who, whose abuse began as children and maybe by the third time they decided to go to, to authorities and make a report, um, maybe not. And so we were quite frankly st like at a loss of how to tell this. Um, we always prioritize centering the folks most affected, but we knew that this would be a different challenge. Um, so what we did was a, a sprint of just listening. We went up to Alaska um, and had an event in, in, in Kotzebue, which is a rural town on, on, the, on the coast, um, where we invited people to, to talk uh, publicly uh, about the issue, invited some stakeholders, and really learned that it was a very challenging topic, even though, as Kyle said, it was, it's, you know, everyone understood that it was completely out of control, but it wasn't something that people were talking about. So there we, we understood what was at stake with inviting people to share their stories and what we would need to do to get them to the finish line. So we, much like uh, other folks on in today's webinar, also had sort of focus groups where we talked to people and asked them, what would it take for you to, to, to see a story where that both reflected your priorities, that defined justice, and that would be an effort in preventing future harm. So a big question, we had, those were big three questions for people, whether they were gonna be a part of our reporting or not. And we learned a lot. So that the project was very much shaped by those listening sessions and by the folks we spoke to before any idea what shape we'd take. Um, we didn't know at that point that it'd be told in 29 stories. We didn't know any of the particulars, um, but the effort to, to do it as a group um, felt true to what we were learning in the reporting process. My colleague, Nadia Sussman, and I, who she's a video reporter at ProPublica, um, dedicated ourselves exclusively to this project for almost a year. So that also explains how we were able to tailor 29 stories um, to the degree that we did um, and build an alliance with, with other team members at, at both newsrooms to, to really bring this to, to the finish line. Um, I wanna answer the second part of your question and say that it really, it does present very unique challenges when you decide to tell 29 stories all together and to do so in a manner that's tailored to each person. Um, that, that was a great, you know, it was very much building a machine as we went along and, and sort of building new parts to the machine to, to help everyone involved feel, we knew that we, we needed utmost consent. We knew that we couldn't um, surprise folks in any way, shape or form. And that lack of control was a huge trigger for the group we were working with, obviously. So that's also how we built the machinery to be so transparent, everything, almost every call was followed up in writing where we would discuss what we discussed in our call, where we'd say, these are our next steps. If you're still with us, let us know and giving the folks ample time to make decisions about participating because we wanted to make sure that the folks that made it to the finish line were truly um, comfortable with everything that it meant to be on the cover of the paper, and what it meant to be um, part of a group. The group, the, the way to present it as a group was also 
ended up being really helpful to everyone involved because they felt comforted knowing that there'd be 20 some other people coming forward together. So that also ended up being um, also an asset. Uh, it was as, as hard as it was and as tailored as it was. Um, I think the day we would published, everyone involved knew that there'd be 20 some other folks and, and that they told us that was really meaningful to them that they wouldn't be coming forward alone. Um, and the, you know, having to tailor everything in, in 29 different ways also meant that by the time we got around to publishing, we needed to build something that reflected how much care we had given and how much voice we wanted to include. And so that's how we, Agnes Chang built the, the site where those stories live from scratch. Everything, every single detail there too was, was tailored. And that's how um, I'll let Anne speak about the, the partnership where the photography also became very, a huge part of, of giving them control of their story, um, which we didn't plan, but again, was a result of following the lead of our sources. Um, and I'll say, the last thing I'll say is that um, following the lead of our sources also meant that we were incredibly impressed from the first phone calls with who they were now, instead of the amount of trauma that they had endured. And, and we were really wanting to highlight um, who they were in spite of the things that had happened to them. And that's really was another guiding principle to say, let's tell these sexual assault stories from a place of power. And we can, from there, move, move forward with what we need to include what we don't need to include and, and also what's important to this person in participating. So that's how we, we navigated that. That's great. And can you, can you speak a little bit about the, the, the photography side of this equation and, and, and how it was, if it was a different, a, a different relationship, a different experience than, than going out and, you know, shooting the mayor, giving a speech? Uh, yeah, th thanks to all of you for having us. <clears throat> this is truly an honor. Um, yeah, it was a completely different experience and the whole shape of the project started out differently in that we, uh, we knew we needed to photograph these people in a way that gave them as much power as possible. So that included going to them going, we traveled all over the state to get their pictures in the places where they wanted to be photographed. Um, places where made, they, they felt powerful in some cases or felt comfort. Um, that, was, that was kind of the bottom line to making it very true. Stepping back one, one step, we, the very initial premise for the, the photo gallery, for lack of a better word, was to have a very similar look for each image. And we quickly decided that that wasn't possible because we wanted to highlight the individuals and show them in, you know, really unique places. And that ended up being, you know, out on glacial flats in a windstorm or in the middle of a snowstorm in Western West Anchorage. Um, one of the portraits was in prison. So they are, they just hopefully really reflect who these people are at the moment. And, um, you know, the, the bottom line was to give them as much courage and help to be a part of this really powerful group. And, and how is, how is this series changed the conversation in Alaska? What kind of an impact do you think it's had in the state? Huh. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're muted, Kyle. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I mean, there's been a bit of a reckoning, I think, the last year or so. Um, you know, I'd like to think that um, if, you know, even if you're someone in a position of power, you know, you can't assume silence, you know, that silence can't be the tool that you use to kind of continue bad behavior or to, um, you know, harass or sexually assault or abuse people. Um, you know, that might be, maybe that's wishful thinking, but um, it feels like, and Anne, I don't, maybe you have more of a sense of this, but it feels like people are just, there's more of a conversation happening than there was five or 10 years ago. And again, but that might not be 
you know, it could be, that's just kind of, um, you know, changing culture too, but, um, but it does feel like we are hearing from more people who are willing to talk about these topics. And do you have any thoughts about that on, on the ground? Yeah, I, I would agree with Kyle. I feel like there's just something has happened. Something has changed. Maybe our stories had a bit to do with it, but I hope society's changing and all of these, all of these stories, including some of the other ones that we've heard about today are giving people power to be able to speak. And, you know, it just feels like actually hearing all of these stories today that we're all part of um, lifting up voices that need desperately to be heard and they are being heard more, I think. And I think it's happening in Alaska. I guess I can't speak to New York or anywhere else, but I feel like it's better here. Well, let me, one last question for you all. And, and that is to go back. We I said at the, at the beginning of our discussion that, you know, that the, the fact that this is a collaboration between, um, you know, a for-profit newspaper and a not-for-profit organization in ProPublica. And, and you have a, um, you know, the, the, the resources, I um, mean, we, nobody meant and noted this, but the resources that you all put into this um, I, I, are really very, that, that in itself is a very powerful ethical statement, Kyle, <laughs> to take that much of your newsroom and put it into, into, a, into a project like this. But I'm just kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about how how did that work on the ground? I mean, how does this collaboration work? I mean, Andrea, how did you come into it, and what did it? What was the intersection? Adrian, do you want to take this, or the? I mean, I can. The the one thing I would say is that we, I wouldn't have had a lot of confidence to do. You know, we, I wouldn't have tried a project like this without help, right? Because I think, you know, the best thing we can do is kind of recognize, you know, what we don't know and what, you know, we're just, we're, we're a really small newspaper and everyone's kind of a utility player and, um, and very much a generalist, you know? And so we were learning, you know, even the call out, right? Like even the first call out we did, there were mistakes that we made that, you know, once we started to talk to the ProPublica engagement team about how, what types of questions to ask and how to follow up, you know, cause that first call out, we got all this information and we just didn't re you know, like people told us the, their most intimate, you know, um, experiences. And then we just, in many cases, didn't even respond. Right. Because, you know, it's, it's all, there's this bottleneck of this small newsroom. And so, um, you know, it just was this full force multiplier to kind of have the, this, you know, some of the best people in the world who do this work come help us and, and show us how to do it. And, you know, and now we feel better about, you know, trying to do that. You know, uh, our newsroom feels like we learned a lot, you know, that we can take with us as we go forward. Yeah, all I would add was that the level of collaboration was incredible from editors to the photographers to everyone that um, we, we pulled in to work on this. Um, it was hard to do. We were in New York four time zones away. And so often it sometimes it was just, you know, from menial, like, can you run and check this out in person to um, getting on the phone very late in our time when, well, people were still at their desk or whatever it meant. Um, but I think the, the way that the project turned out, it was completely, you know, uh, uh, an example of what can happen when, when folks really um, free up the space and resources and time to, to honor the sources. Cause I do think there was a tremendous transformation for the people involved as sources in the project, which I also think is a responsibility of the work that we do. And I know that for these 29 people, it really changed their lives. And, um, you know, they were featured in billboard size images, uh, downtown Anchorage a month after we published when the museum um, offered to host the, the journalistic pieces on their walls. Um, this was now COVID and, and we were able to do that outside and, and we could have never done that just on the ProPublica side. So the, the collaboration went both ways for sure. Well, um, I wanna first of all, congratulate the th 
all the, everyone who's involved and certainly the three of you and everyone who was involved on in winning the 2021 Payne Award. Um, and uh, I wish we were all here in person and able to hand you, hand you your plaques and what have you, but they're, I, I'm, I'm told they're in the mail, so, <laughs> or will be, I guess, I don't know. Um, but again, congratulations. Thank you so much for the work. Thank you for being here today. Uh, and and uh, uh, we wish you all the best going forward. Uh, so this is, I just wanna remind everyone that this session was recorded uh, and it will be emailed to registered attendees after the event. And it will be posted on the uh, social our SOJC social media channels and, and, and YouTube channel as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, the Payne Barker family for their continued support over 21 years of the Ansel Payne Awards for Ethics and Journalism. Um, as, as we noted earlier in the, in the, in the program, uh, because of their generosity, uh, we've been able to honor and reward journalists who are playing a crucial role in society while adhering to very strict and very necessary ethical standards. And I think this last hour has really been a pretty extraordinary representation of the, the powerful work that's being done around the country um, by journalists in large newsrooms and small newsrooms and for-profit newsrooms and not-for-profit organizations uh, to expose wrongdoing, to, to highlight systemic issues that we need to deal with as a society and doing that with, under great pressure. And so our congratulations to all of our winners, all of our finalists, and we thank you for the evening and uh, thank you all for joining us and good night. <laughs>